you very much. Good evening, friends. Very happy to be here again tonight <clears throat> to meet you in the name of the Lord Jesus and to minister to you and, to and pray with you. I see there's quite a few handkerchiefs here tonight. We'll pray over them just in a little bit. And we are, we're happy that you believe that to be the truth that comes from God's Word. And I remember down in Africa, I was, they had about 16 sacks of handkerchiefs just setting uh, letters, and the uh, newspaper said, Brother Branham is a little superstitious, said he's, he was praying over handkerchiefs. And that's how far people get away from the Bible, to not know it. That's scripture and commanded by the, by the Bible, by the people, the Lord, to, to do those things. Now, tonight, tomorrow afternoon is the closing service, which I suppose will be about, about 2.30 or 3 o'clock sometime. When do you start, Don? At 3 o'clock. Then they'll give out prayer cards about 1.30 or 2. So as soon as you leave your church, wherever it is, and you visitors here now that's out of town, that's been here, why, there's some mighty fine churches around town here, and we, the brother here, he's, he's got a mighty nice church up here, and these other ministers here, I suppose, cooperating, I've never met yet back here, and there's some mighty fine churches, and we want you to attend some of those churches in the morning, and uh, your church of your choice. And if you're a member of some church, why well, you stand at your post of duty tomorrow. And uh, I want to appreciate uh, Brother Glenn for, for this, uh, making this meeting on Sunday afternoon to close, because it shows a real fellowship and a brotherhood among man that we want every person to stand at their post of duty at their church, or that's your place, that's your duty to be there. I've always tried to make it a custom to close on Sunday afternoon with my service on Sunday afternoon, and after we get the gospel tent, we'll do the same thing. Close up on Sunday afternoon, after the Sunday afternoon service, and have no morning service, so that people can tend their own church. We feel that every person is duty-bound to tend some church and belong to some church as a Christian. Now, the Bi many people say, oh, I'll stay home and read my Bible. I'm just as well off. No, the Bible said we shouldn't forsake to assemble ourselves together. We've got to do that. We've got to stand together. And um, all the churches. I heard a little Baptist preacher this morning. I forget what guy something from here. I was hearing him on the radio. And uh, I sure appreciate that preacher if he's here anywhere. And brother, you just keep that message up. That's very good. Guy Smith or... Johnson, that's him. Uh, Brother Johnson, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if you're here, I sure appreciate you. That was a real message. God bless you. And our brother here also, you heard his message today. And all of them, see, we are all together working for one great cause, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, if we can just only get the barriers broke down. Last night I was talking about medical science, chiropractic, osteopathic, and what more? Surgery and medical science, and all those things, if they just didn't fight one another, if they all tried to work together, what a great help it would be if a doctor seen that the chiropractor could help him, if they'd be buddies together and the chiropractic sees past his setting a bone or whatever it is, and then the osteopathic find out that his muscular conditions couldn't be relieved, they'd have to have an operation and send him to the surgeon. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be the way we should be. And now that's for the medical association. Now the ministers. The Methodists and Baptists and the Presbyterians, all of us, Pentecostal and what we are, ought to be the same way. Yeah. That's right. When I was pastor of the Baptist Tabernacle at Jeffersonville, well, um, and the Milltown Baptist Church and other places, I remember I had a, my tabernacle, which still stands at Jeffersonville. And it, and now, I'll just show you, we got a Methodist preacher in there now, <laughs> a preaching, taking my place. But when I was pastoring up there, and I had a good friend that was born down the same part of Kentucky where I was born, and he had the Main Street Methodist Church in New Albany, just about five miles below us, which is a very lively little church. 
Well, we had the very best of fellowship. While he was having a revival, I closed up my church and went down there. He'd do the same thing for me. Now, we kid one another a little bit. That's just in preachers. You know, of course, now you lay if you don't know this, you see. But we'd kid one another. For instance, he'd say to me sometime, I'd come up, someone would come in, get saved, and I'd say, well, uh, brother, what church did you ever belong to? Well, my people were Methodists, Brother Branham, and uh, I want you to sprinkle me, see? I believe in sprinkling. Well, I said, I tell you, brother, you know, you never make a good member here, though you're a brother. But I've got a good friend down in New Albany by the name of Johnson, and uh, he's a Methodist, and he sprinkles. So I tell you what, let me take you down there and talk over with it with Brother Johnson, because he's a fine man. He's every whit of a Christian, a fine, lively church, just Holy Spirit-filled and really good people. I say, I'll take you down there and talk to him. That's pretty dry. There's not much water down there, but he'll treat you right. Well, if he get a member that was said, now, Brother Johnson, I, I believe in being baptized by mercy. I, I'd like to be baptized. He'd say, well, I tell you, I, I don't baptize, but Billy up there at Jeffersonville, the tabernacle, he's a Baptist, and uh, he's a fine fellow. You'll make him a good member, but I tell you, he's a Baptist. He'll hold you under every bubble quits coming up. And so, you know, now, we'd go on to each other like that, but we were had fellowship one with another. Not one flaw with Brother Johnson, wonderful man, although we might disagree in theology and speaking, but we, on the same principle we believe. The Lord Jesus Christ died to save sinners. That's it. Yes. And I believe all of us believe that. And our other little petty things, we should forget them and just go right on serving the Lord. And if I couldn't agree with anyone, that don't mean he still isn't my brother. And, and that's just fine. I want the other men to think the same about me because if it was nine of us boys, and I, my brother next to me, a great big six-footer weighs about 190 pounds, blonde-headed, flat nose, square chin, <laughs> why he don't look like me? There's no resemblance at all in us. And there, why he likes, he likes to play golf, and, and I, I think that's silly. And, uh, I like to hunt, and he thinks that's silly. So, I mean, I like cherry pie, and he likes apple pie. We both <laughs> have our differences. We don't look alike. Our nature is not alike. But his father is my father. Yes. If the Branham family could receive him on his peculiarities and receive me, my peculiarities, then we're brothers. And if God can receive you on your peculiar doctrine and me on my peculiar doctrine and give us both the Holy Spirit, we're brothers. Right, regardless of what it is. We are brothers. And that's the way we have fellowship one with another while the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. All sin is taken away. Now, in these handkerchiefs, ben, I have more success with the handkerchiefs, I guess, than anything else, especially with the American people. American people got an idea in their head. If somebody has to touch them or, or do something to them or lay hands on them, where they ever got that, it's just a Jewish tradition, and I'm trying to get you to believe the Gentile way of it. See, the Jew said, now you come lay your hands on my little girl and she'll live, Jeriah, says the Jew. But the Roman said, I'm not worthy that you'd even come under my house, come under my roof. He said, I'm a man under authority, and I'll say to this man, go, he goeth. Everything under me has to mind me. And he recognized his supreme authority that Jesus had over diseases. He said, you just speak the word, and my servant will live. Now, there you are. That's it. Now, Jesus never said too much about Jairus, only he got what he asked for. He went and laid his hand on the daughter. But he said to these people there that followed, he said, now, that's great faith. I haven't found faith like that in Israel. See? Now, we want the greater faith. We want it on a higher level. It's not the Lord Jesus wants us to believe him. And now many of you in reading the book, and it's just too bad just a few nights running like this tonight. You, it's, it isn't just to the people. And that's the way all my ministry has always been. In Africa, in India, in different places, one and two and three nights with anywhere from 100 up to 500,000 people. They wouldn't know. By the time you get to say, Get acquainted, then you have to say goodbye. 
and that isn't fair to the people. That's the reason that by a vision the Lord has showed me to get this big tent and stay from four to six weeks in places. Many times people come in that line. They get healed. They go away. I've seen people come take the Bible, totally blind, stand there and read it for the first time they'd read since they were maybe 20 or 30 years. And in two weeks, a man be just as blind as he was when he comes to the platform the first time. Not understanding. See? Don't realize that when the unclean spirit's gone out of a man, he walks in dry places. And he comes back with seven other spirits worse than he was. That's what the Bible says. Enters right in and seven times worse than it was at the first place. See what it is? You must know how to approach. You must know what diseases are. I eventually said, this it's a doctor that 1% of the people in here would actually know what a cancer consists of, what a tumor, cataract, what tuberculosis, what a germ is, how it comes, what brought it here, where its life come from, all those things. And not knowing it, the strange thing it is, is many times doctors don't know. They know the girl's there, but what caused it? It's got to have a reason. It's got to be there for some cause. And it's a life. It's not your life. It's another life that come in you. It's another cell, a developing of cells, multiplication cells. That's what you are. And that's what a germ is, a cancer germ, tumor, cataract, any other germ. It's in you for one purpose. It's a death. In your mortal flesh, a cancer sucking your blood, killing you. It's a growth. It has no form. You take form after the nature of your father. Or any, anything after its kind, every seed after its kind. You have the seed of a human being, it will produce a human being. Seed from a dog will produce a dog. From a bird will produce a bird. But a cancer, tumor, cataract, any of those diseases, they don't have any. They're a spiritual thing. And they just form any kind of a, a malignancy or whatever it is and spread forth. Some of them, well, these kinds of cancer. Some of it's called sarcomas and open cancer. And some of it is called a red cancer, black cancer. And, all different kinds. Tumors, some of them are small, some of them are large, some of them grow with legs. And the word cancer comes the word crab, meaning legs running out like that. But all those things behind it has to have a life because they're alive and they're eating. And if it's alive, where did it come from? Now, you know, I'm in a mixed crowd and you're a fine audience. And it's, uh, you, don't, you listen to your doctor and I'm your brother. Listen, like the baby and the mother. We know where that come from, holy wedlock, ordained of God. But where did this cancer come from? Who brought him? How did he how'd he come? He's here to take your life. Where did he come from? What's his nature? He's a killer. Now, the doctor deals with the substance, the growth. Divine healing deals with the life. When the life goes out, how many deer hunters are in here? Let's see your hands. All right. Thank you. I got one brother back. <laughs> All right. Is there a butcher here, undertaker, anything that deals with something as it's dead? You take and kill a deer tonight, brother. Shoot it in the field. Lay it up on a scale and see how much it weighs. Be careful what you tell the boys when you go back to camp. In the morning, it'll weigh pounds lighter. It shrinks. Let a little animal... Lay out your let someone die. The undertaker will take false teeth or artificial eye out because it shrinks the body. A little dog will get run over on the road. It'll shrink. But let it lay there for 72 hours, three days and nights, that sun and stuff. Lay it on a scale and see what it weighs. Weighs more than it ever did. It's swelling, deteriorating, breaking. Now the cancer, when the life goes out of it, the patient is relieved. The cataract, whatever it is, it shrinks for Oh, a few, a few days, maybe anywhere within three days and nights. That's the reason Jesus' body couldn't lay three days and nights in the grave, because David said, I'll not ho suffer my Holy One to see corruption. Not one cell would corrupt. Corruption sets in. That's the reason some people say, well, oh, he never laid in a grave. He died on Friday afternoon and rose up Sunday morning. But within that three days and nights, he knew he was coming forth because one prophecy, one word in the Bible by a prophet said, I'll not suffer my Holy One to see corruption. And he knew within that 72 hours, corruption had set in sometime between there, God would bring him out. Just think of that. When you've got 600 and something promises in the New Testament for divine healing, 
Just think of it. You can't. Hard to believe it, isn't it? But anyhow, when this growth is dead, it shrinks. The patient rejoices, oh, how happy. In a few days, they find themselves worse off than they was in the first place. Oh, well, they say, I guess I lost my healing. And just as sure as faith takes it away, unbelief resurrects it again. Then it's really on the move. But when you get sick after about 72 hours, you're supposed to. A dead ball of flesh in your body. What purifies the blood? The heart purifies the, body, the blood. And if heart pumps it, stores an infection, it causes fever, and every, all kinds of feelings and sickness. After 72 hours that you've been prayed for with cancer, tumor, or anything, and you begin to get real sick and a high fever, that's one of the best signs in the world that you're healed. Just keep on. See, your faith is not what you feel. Your faith is what you believe. If you really believe it, I don't care how you feel, you'd never, never say you wasn't healed. You'd always believe it. That's what does it. See, that's what happens here at the platform when I have healing services. Hundreds of people that way. They come to the platform, oh, Brother Branham, I got all faith. It was ink, it wouldn't dot an eye. See? You've got hope instead of faith. Faith is positive. There's no, nothing can move it. It's positive. No matter how sick you got, how everything went, nothing, you, now if you're trying to bluff it, it won't take bluffing. The devil's not, he's a bluff himself, and he knows how to run a bluff. But when you got the goods, it don't take loud hollering. It don't take stomping and screaming. It takes faith. You recognize it. Word. Just say the word. Look at the disciples down there, what they all were doing over this child, probably trying to shake it and everything else. But Jesus said, Come out of it. That settled it. That devil recognized that was faith. See? It's not quantity, it's quality. See? Bodily exercise profit little. You don't have to run around over the floor, which. I don't blame anybody from getting healed for running, screaming, shouting. You said, do you believe in shouting, Brother Benham? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Don't think that. I'm one Baptist that believes in shouting. <laughs> now, I believe. Now, we never, we Baptists don't do like you Northern Baptists up here do. We old-fashioned Baptists down there in the South, old missionary Baptists down the mountains of Kentucky. When we come to the altar, we didn't go down and shake one another's hands and put our name on the book. We beat one another in the back till we come through. We got something. That's right. It's too bad we got starchy with it, isn't it, Brother Baptist? That's right. That's right. Remember old churches back there, they didn't care where it was Baptist, Presbyterian. When they had a revival, they got in there and preached the gospel and shouted and praised the Lord. You could lose your pocketbook out on the creek bank, had a hundred dollars in, somebody bring it to you. They found it. Lord. Honest. I'll take that any time. The Lord bless you. I just want to speak to you tonight because I've got a real bad throat, tired, just wore out. And I've got to leave after tomorrow afternoon, go right straight home and speak there and come right straight back and begin Wednesday night up at the Charlotte. At um, I don't know the name of the place. I believe it's Fox Auditorium or Fox, Fox Theater. I've never even met the minister up there who it is, but I know it's Brother Bigsby, brother-in-law, and if he's anything to do with Brother Bigsby, he's a good man. Brother Bigsby is a fine man. And this brother here knows him and recommends him, so I can't think of it. I'm going to call him Brother Glenn. That's what I was calling him the other day. So uh, I want to call him Spurzel, Sparson, and <laughs> I get it mixed up. So now... And bring in your handkerchiefs. Now, that is the Bible. Now, many of you, I've been reading your letters. Said, Brother Bram, will you anoint my handkerchief? Now, that's all right. What the Lord does, we appreciate that. Anything he blesses, we're for it. But if you're bear witness with me with the Bible, Paul didn't anoint handkerchiefs. He just took from his body handkerchiefs and apron. See? Now, where I think he got that's when the Shunammite woman comes to Elijah. And she knew God was in his prophet, so she went to find out why her child had died. And so Elijah knew that everything he touched was blessed, so he told Gehazi, said, take this staff and go lay it on the child. But the woman's faith wasn't in the staff, it was in the prophet. But she said, I'll not leave you until you, till I find out or know what I want to know. And so he went with her. 
And you notice it wasn't his prayer. He laid his body on the dead child, and it come to life. See? Now, these handkerchiefs, we send thousands of them a week everywhere, all over the world. And if any time you need one, just write me at Jeffersonville, Indiana. We'll send it to you. Now, the, and we got a prayer band around the world where I've been. We was looking on a globe today in just a very few spots that the Lord hasn't permitted me to preach the gospel in yet on the world. And, um, and then in there, we form a prayer band that people get up at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, the world around, according to the, the third, sixth, and ninth hour, three, uh, 9 o'clock at morning, 12 o'clock at noon, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and everybody with one universal prayer, praying one for another, something's got to happen. There's millions of them. See? And we want you to get in on this, to pray with us and help us to minister to the people that when we get up there, we want you to have a part in the ministry. Now, I don't have any radio time. I don't have anything to sell. We got books, but I'm not a book salesman. I buy those books at 40 cents less than what I get them. Have to take them. I've never bought a bunch of books, but I've lost hundreds of dollars on it. The people who's got them is commanded. If any poor old man comes, woman, and don't have money to buy it, give it to them anyhow. And they tear them up and everything else, we lose them. So I've always went in debt with books. There, I've got several of books that people have wrote of me. I never write books. But I don't, I'm not a book salesman. The pictures, I buy them from the Douglas Studios. They're copyrighted. He dares them to touch one any other way. And they're copyrighted. And I buy them from the Douglas Studios and then sell them. Buy them by the thousands and sell them just at what I have to pay for them so that people can get them for the message. I don't have any radio program. I've always kept my, my congregation small, my church small, where I don't have to have any money. I never took up an offering in my life. I've been preaching for 23 years and never took an offering in my life. I remember one time I started to. Uh, you know, did you ever get time, all of us poor people, where you can't make ends meet? Did you ever get that place? Sure you have. And I couldn't make ends meet about, about 15 years ago, 12 or 15 years ago, and I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to take up an offering at the church tonight. She said, I'm going over to watch you do it. So I told one of the deacons to get my hat. I said, folks, I hate to ask you, but I said, I'm just in a tight spot, and I want you to, I want a little offering, if you will, put in any nickel or dime, something other, and to help me over this little place, and I appreciate it. So the deacon got my hat and started off, and I looked down, sitting, and an old mother had always prayed for me. You remember the old women used to wear a little apron with a pocket on the inside of it? You ever see one of them? Uh, the old timers, my grandma used to carry her tobacco and a little cane pipe in there, you know, so that the man folks couldn't see her smoking. So, but this little old woman had a little pocket like that, and she pulled out one of the little pocketbooks with a catch over the top of it and began reaching out after those nickels. I'm telling you, I thought my heart would jump out of my mouth. I couldn't have tucked that if I had to. I said, oh, I was just teasing you. I didn't mean that. Everybody looked at me real funny. I said, I was just going on to you. You know I never took an offering. So when I went home, there'd been an old man by the name of John Ryan, just recently went to glory, real old fella. And he rode an old bicycle down there. He looked like he bumped the house of David. He had long hair and beard. And he come down and left the old bicycle and give it to me. And I went and got a dime and went to 10 cent store and got some paint and painted up and sold it for $5. Didn't have to take offering after all. So God will supply every need you want. So on those things, well, what I said that far is when I'm saying, write to me, we have an awful time getting the letters answered. It's not to try to dun you or bill you because I have nothing to bill for. If you've got money to put in church, give it to your pastors and support your own radio programs and things you have around here. And mine, I, I don't need it. It's absolutely free. Uh, everything that we have is free. So I just say that. And if you want one of the claws, you stand. And sometimes people does put in a little something for help it out and... And uh, we buy several hundred dollars worth of stamps a week and things like that. Sometimes it's done, but you're not requested to. Just stand and get it. Keep it in your Bible. It's all right. Now, before I forget it, I want to pray for these handkerchiefs now. Now, not only do I want to pray, I want you to pray with me, each one of you. This is somebody's daddy waiting for these, somebody's mother, and they're dear to someone, and they're God's children and believers. So let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come to Thee as a group of believing people, 
Thou hast said in thy word that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. And what they agree upon is touching one thing, and as they shall receive it, shall be given to them. And now, here's these handkerchiefs. And we're taught in the Bible that they took from the body of St. Paul handkerchiefs and aprons. Unclean spirits went out of the people. Diseases were healed. And Father, we realize that we're not St. Paul, but you're still Jesus. You're the one who healed, not Paul. They recognized that you were with him. And surely you would not act that way in the time of a crisis. And then when the same thing arises, as I've said, you must act the same way. We're unworthy to ask this. There's no good thing about us, but it's because you have bid us to do it. Just like the serpent on the pole, no virtue in the serpent or pole, but obedience is what brought the results. And may it be so tonight, Father. Out yonder on the hillside, back over behind the mountains, a little mother paces the floor, waiting for the handkerchief to come to her sick baby. Poor old blind daddy sitting out yonder in a little room tonight, white cane in his hand. He's heard. Faith cometh by hearing. He's waiting for this handkerchief to return. Oh, God, of the many more in the hospital. We're taught in the Bible that you promised the Israelites the promised land, from Canaan to the promised land. And one day when they stepped out of Egypt to take their stand to go to the promised land, the Red Sea got in their way. They were backed up by Pharaoh's army, the mountains and deserts on one side, and the Red Sea was in the path. One writer said, God looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes. And when he looked up on the Red Sea, it got scared, for it was cutting off the people of God that had the promise, and they were marching on. It got scared and moved back. Israel passed on, on the journey. Oh, God, tonight, when these handkerchiefs are placed upon the sick and the afflicted, may you look back through the blood of Jesus with angry eyes. May the diseases that's holding the people get scared. For the great quake on Easter morning prove that he lives. And may it move back. And may they have the promise of good health as the Bible has given the promise. Grant it, Lord, and it's for this purpose that we send these handkerchiefs. In the name of thy beloved child, the Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you very much for praying for those handkerchiefs. And now, let's go straight to the Word. I love the Word, don't you? I wish I just had a little more throat maybe tomorrow afternoon. If I don't strain too much tonight, I'll speak to you a little while tomorrow afternoon on a gospel subject. Tonight I thought I would just give just a little preliminary and maybe see what the Lord will do for us and prayer for the sick. Now in St. John, the 12th chapter, the 37th verse, we read this, beginning at the 37th and reading down to the 40th inclusive. But though he had done so many miracles before them, they yet believed not on him. What is a miracle? It's something that cannot be explained. 38th verse, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spake, the Lord who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, or understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I should heal them. They couldn't because the prophet had said. 
Now, another place I have chosen is in St. John, the 10th chapter, and the 37th verse, the 38th. If I do not the works of my Father, said Jesus, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And may he add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, coming to this thought, that we are faced tonight in this age with a, a supernatural move of the living God. And, of course, we realize that we have many things that to you, Presbyterian, Catholic, Methodist, there's no doubt that you have heard of many fanaticisms, which we have that. We admit that. It's hooked into everything. I've seen fanatic Presbyterians. I've seen fanatic Baptists. I've seen fanatic Catholics. I've seen fanatic Pentecostals. I've seen fanatic divine healing. I've seen impersonations of supernatural. But what does it all speak of? Of a real one. That all means that there's a real one it's made off of. Now, there is a true and living God, and he's duty-bound to his word. And now, being at the ministry, I never got no education, and so he gave me another way, by sovereign grace, to minister to his people, and that was through visions. Now, I thought tonight that I would take a few moments and explain by the Scripture and so forth what visions are. What is a vision? Someone has asked many times. Brother Branham, are you impressed to say certain things? Do you just think it in your mind? No, sir. I see it. It's just there like I'm looking at you. Just the same as you are, only you know you're standing here, yet you may be 40 years back in somebody's life, seeing what's taking place, even seeing the way they're dressed positionally and everything. And then I have to talk, and when I'm talking, seeing the vision... I don't know whether they're hearing me here, whether I'm loud or not. That's the reason I say to the operator here, in every way, if just in this small place where I know you're getting a rebound in this gymnasium room of my voice, whether you really understand it. But a, a vision is a God, by a word of knowledge, dropping to the person to foresee or foresee something tell something that has been or something that will be. Now, I'm going to make it real simple. we got little bright-eyed children sitting here, and if Jesus tarries, that's the men and women of tomorrow. And I think that too many times that we make the gospel so complicated that just maybe the adults and so forth could understand it and don't realize that those little children get it also. Now, I'm going to say there's a circus in town. Now, the first thing, I want to say that all gifts and callings are without repentance. The Scripture says that. Who taking thought can add one cubic to his statue? You are because God has made you. Here some time ago, a woman come to a meeting. She was at home. Something struck her. She had arthritis. She was drawn up. Something struck her that the Lord was going to heal her. She knew it positive. She wasn't guessing at it. She knew it was so. So when she got a cab, set the, out of the stretcher into the cab, brought her to the place while in the meeting that night, not even prayed for her, but when she seen the Spirit of God working, moving, she said, That's it, Lord Jesus. That's what I've looked forward to. Thank you. And when she got out of the cab, the cab said, Madam, should I come back after the service to pick you up? said, I won't need you. I'm going to walk home. And while the service is going on, the Lord straightened those crippled legs, and she got right up and walked home. 
Of course, it was noised abroad. Another woman said, you know, I I'm going to do the same thing. She takes the cab and goes up, tells the cab to leave, but the cab had to come back and get her. She was trying to mimic somebody else's faith, and you can't do that. The devil knows the better than that. You can't fool him. You've got to have what you profess to have. Now, when really in your heart, just like I was talking about faith the sight, how many thinks that shirt's white? Will you raise your hand? You believe it's white? Now, what if I told you it was red? Would you believe it? No, sir. You have confidence in your sight. You know it's white. Well, if you've got that same kind of confidence in your faith, you know you're going to be healed tonight just as sure as your sight says that's white. Your faith says you're going to be healed. That settles it. It's all over. You don't have to worry no more about it. Faith has already took a hold. It should come by preaching the Word. That's the first way. But God sets in the church different gifts for to bring His church together. Through the years, you see, the Bible said, the prophet said, there will be a day that will not be neither light nor dark, but in the evening it shall be light. Now, when the Holy Spirit first fell on the church, it was in the eastern people, in Jerusalem. That's where the Holy Ghost fell. And great signs and wonders was done by the church in the early Pentecostal age of the early church. Then the next round of the apostles, then come in the Catholic Church, then the 1,500 years, then the Lutheran, and then from that on down, it's been a day where the light went out, and it's been a daylight enough that you could see that Jesus was the Son of God. You should repent, but the real bright light of the Holy Ghost has never shined through these ages. Certainly the Bible said it wouldn't. And if the prophet said it wasn't just as sure as he said they couldn't believe because Isaiah said, there hasn't been light because the prophet said. There's been enough light to know that you ought to do right and wrong. There's been enough light to know that you believed on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, accept his personal Savior, put your name on a church book, and lived a good life. But as far as signs and wonders and the direct rays of the sun shining, it hasn't been since Pentecost. But the Bible said, and the prophet said, that in the evening it shall be light. Now, geographically, the sun rises in the east. That was the Pentecostal blessing first. And it's setting in the west. And civilization has traveled westward. And we're all with the west coast now. It's revolving back. So the evening sun is setting. And God, in this last days, is shining forth. The same sun that shined on the Pentecostal people there is shining back on the church today with the same signs and wonders. Amen. The light shall shine when it gets evening time. The clouds are moved away. Jesus is revealed. He comes into our meetings. He makes himself known. He shows himself alive like he did back there to them. He's showing himself alive here. The clouds are all moved away now. This is those evening lights. What a happy time to live. The Bible said in this last day that he had raised up young men to see visions, old men to dream dreams. He poured out his spirit upon all flesh. He promised it. He promised prophets in the last days. He promised signs and wonders in the last days. He promised the same results that was at Pentecost would fall again in the last days. And this is it. Yes. We're here. I wish I had just a little more voice. All right. However, what is a vision? What breaks up at a vision? What dimension? What Adam lets loose? It will never be known. That's God's secret. But here's what a vision, to make it so that the children would understand it. There's a great big circus comes to town. And we're all little boys and girls standing out around this, and we haven't got the money to go in. And, you know, we just like to see elephants, don't we? And we like to see giraffes and, and all the different things in there. That's, we like to see that, see? But we haven't got the money to go in. But there's some of us, great big wide-shouldered and strong man, like him. And maybe there's some of us, he's strong. Maybe there's some of us that's tall and thin. Now, we, maybe if we're tall and thin, 
Well, we, we want to be short and strong, but don't do no good. God made us tall and thin. And if we want to be a, a tall, the short and strong wants to be tall and thin, he can't help it. He's got to be the way God made him. See, God makes us every way. God's a God of variety. He makes yellow flowers and white flowers and, and blue flowers and red flowers. See, he don't make them all the same. He makes little bitty mountains and great big mountains, little bitty trees and big trees. He makes mountains and deserts. He makes uh, waters and lakes and streams and rivers. And see, he's a God of variety. He makes some of us uh, red hair and some of us white hair and some of us black hair. See, he makes us all different ways. That's the way he likes it. You see the way he does it. See, I like it that way too, don't you? Everybody likes it that way, see. Now, here's what we are. We're all at a great big carnival. And while we're standing along with this group tonight, maybe the Lord made me just a little taller than you are. But maybe that was his grace to do that. But you're a little stronger than I am. Well, now, we look all around. And first thing we see, way up here is a knot hole. Well, I'm not quite tall enough to reach up to it myself, and surely you're not. So then, I want to see what's on the inside, and you do too. So you say, uh, Brother Brandon, see what's on the inside. I say, just a minute. I get down, make a great big jump, my finger just barely catch the top of the board. I pull real hard, and I look through this little knot hole, I say, I, I, I see an elephant. Oh, you did, uh-huh. What else did you see, Brother Brandon? Mm. Well, I'll try again. I'll jump way up and grab a hold of it. i hold it with my fingers. I... <sighs> a giraffe. Yes, sir. Now, after a while, the carnival owner comes by. What's the matter, boy? Oh, I say, I was just looking through that knot hole. He said, now, just a minute. He picks me up by the back of the neck and holds me up. He said, you see, Hunter? Now, you start in here, and that's this, and this is this, and this is that, and this is that, and on down. That's the whole thing. See? Then he sets me down. I'm not painting and blowing. He lifted me up. Now, do you know what I mean? Now, adults, when the person comes to the platform and a vision is formed, it's their faith. Like the woman that touched his garment. He didn't know, no. How did he know she touched him? He said, I got weak. What was it? The woman was pulling through him God that she needed for her healing. Now, which was the greatest miracle? When the woman touched his faith and got he uh, touched his garment and went out there and he said, Who touched me? Nobody knowed. She said, Not me. All of them denied. He kept looking around until he found that channel, we call it. You say that. That channel where he found the woman. He said, Oh, you're the one. And she come and fell down and said, Yes, that's right. Now, he got weak at that. But now when God wanted to use his gift, Christ, and he picked up Christ and said, Now wait, you leave this home, and you go away and be gone four days, and they're going to send for you, but don't you go, because Lazarus is going to die. And on the fourth day you return back, you're going to find a stone laying over the grave. I'm going to get glory to myself, and I want you to have them to take away the stone. And then you speak, and when you speak Lazarus' name, he's coming forth. Jesus, obedient to the Father, does nothing he said to the Father, showed him first in a vision. Does the Bible say that? How many has read it this week since we've been talking about it? St. John 5, 19. Yes, sir. Jesus said, I do nothing at all until the Father shows me first, and I go do what he tells me. I do nothing except he shows me. That's right. Jesus said that. Did he tell the truth? Yes. He had to. Then, when Jesus had that vision, come back, he said, did he tell him that? Why, it's a grave. He said so. So I thank me, Father, has already said me, but I said it for those who stood by, that they might know the example to pray. See, he was an example. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. He knew. Look over there. He said, over there. He didn't have to wait till he got there. He said, Lazarus, our friend, is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, but I'll go wake him. See? See, he knew what was going to happen because the Father had showed him. Now, there was no virtue loss there. God used his gift. Now, the woman used God's gift to get from God what she wanted. God used his own gift to show what he wanted. Now, that is the same thing today. Now, when a vision, a person is standing in the audience, and some people just can't seem to conceive it, Brother Ram, what makes you so weak? What makes you fall out so? You ought to stand in the place one time. 
It's the people's faith that's a doing it. That's the one you lift up. Say, like the person standing here, here stands a person. Well, who are they? I don't know. Now, what is it? I'm yielding myself. The person's a moving. The person's standing there. First thing you know, I begin to tell whether they're Christian or not. They've got a welcome spirit. Now, what is it? Here we go. The challenge. Up. I hear a doctor say she's the last stage of cancer. Cancer. Uh huh. That's right. What else? Oh my. See? You're already wore out. Um, well, let us speak and see what he. Here it goes again. And when you come down, why? Well, you uh, come from somewhere and you had certain, certain things that. Yeah. That's right. See? That's you using God's gift. Now, someone says, Brother Bram, is that the only time? That's just an amateur time. That's not really the perfect will of God to do that. That's God permitting it. The will of God, I've got two boys here with me tonight. One of them a Catholic. The other, and I don't know, I don't believe you belong to any church at all. One a steam fitter, and the other, I believe, was a, worked in a, some kind of a tavern. And they come to Hammond, Indiana, and they watch them things. They said there's some trick to that. So they said they formed themselves a little clue of FBI of their own. So they followed me, and they slipped into Jeffersonville where I live, and wanted to see if that went on at home. Why, well, it's more at home a thousand times more than it is in the meeting. That's God using His own gift. This morning, let me tell you something. This morning, thus saith the Lord. My Bible over my heart, God my judge, real early, I woke up, was walking in the room. I kept feeling him near, just like a sixth sense. I didn't see it, but I knew he was there. I went and sat down in a chair. I walked back and forth. I raised up the shade. The sun was shining in. I said, Lord, what would you have me to do? I kept waiting, nothing said nothing. I knelt down by the side of the bed. I began praying. I said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Is there something that your servant should do this day? Then come a vision. And he told me just what for the day and what was going to take place to the day. I called up Gene, Leo, Mr. Mercer, and Mr. Gold, they're here tonight. Call my son. They come to the room. I said, I have a vision. This is thus saith the Lord. I'm going to a certain city today. I've never been in my life. We're going to meet a certain condition. And there's going to be a miracle take place that will even have to change nature to do it. And a great healing is going to take place. And explain to him just what would take place. I said, on the road back, we're going to go to a, a place where there is a Western Union. And then there's going to be a message for somebody that sent me from another country that wants me to do a certain thing, and I am to tell that person, no, I can't do it. Though it looks very like I should, but I'm to tell them no. They're here now. I ordered, asked my son to get his car. He got the car, and we drove over a hundred miles today and went straight to the spot, and every word of it, just as perfect as it could be, God changed the whole routine of nature and performed a miracle. You'll hear about it later. Hey? Come right back. He said, now what about the Western Union? And if the man standing here in the building who was at this little Western Union, they drove up here, said, no, this is a branch office. You have to go down to another place down here. Went down there, and there was a telegram with every word that had just come in, exactly the way the vision showed it. See? That happens hundreds of times. See? That, that never bothered me. That's God using his gift. But you pulling from it, that's you using God's gift. You say, Brother Bama, could you tell me what you No, sir, I can't do it. I can't do what I want to. It's him. I can't make myself see a vision. It's him to do it. But he told me, if you get the people to believe you, when the angel met me that night, you were reading the book. And he said, if you can get the people to believe you, then be sincere when you pray. Nothing shall stand before that prayer. That's the reason I was saying last night what I did. If I spoke wrong, I'm sorry. And I said, you've got to keep still. 
When I say keep still, don't move, and you keep on going on, that shows you don't believe. See, you've got to believe it. See, if you will believe, get the people to believe you, then be sincere when you pray, then nothing will stand. But no matter, here not long ago, a woman come to the altar, uh, up to the platform. She was walking with two crutches. Walked up there and I said, lady, the Holy Spirit did rather through the lips of the servant. Here's, see all these recorders? That's how I hear just exactly what's said. I don't know what I'm saying on the vision. But then the boys here and the recorders take it, take it right back. And we got every meeting we've had for years and years. Tell you exactly. And not one time has it ever failed. And it never will. I saw visions for 40-something years. And never has it failed. I saw visions when I was a sinner. Why, it was a gift. First vision I ever remember, my mama told me of me speaking to her when I wasn't quite two years old. Gifts and callings are without repentance. You're born that way. The trait's in you. It's like you're born with blue eyes or black eyes or brown eyes or what. It's something God has done. And that's just, that's the only way it can correctly be. It has to come from God, not something you merit. It's what God has ordained to be. Then it's of God. If you're just bluffing and make it up, your hand, it'll be wrong. See? Now, watch this. Always this woman, when she comes, she had her crutches. She walked up. I said, lady, you come to the meeting because that someone told you to come. You don't even believe in the faith that upset her. And she said, uh, I belong to a certain, certain church. And she said, I love my church. I said, you should do it. But you've got to believe. She said, well, can you help me? I said, no, ma'am. I can't. I said, your help will have to come with your individual faith in the finished works of Christ. And she said, uh, she said, well, I'll believe that. And I said, will you believe it with all your heart? She said, yes. And I said, then I looked back to her again. And the darkness that was over had left. And I said, do you believe me to be his servant? Yes. I said, then I want you to walk up there at the end of the, the stairs and throw away your crutches, walk on down off the platform. She said, you expect me to do that after being on these crutches for all these years? I said, I thought you said you believed me. I said, now you'll always be on those crutches. And just then they brought an old woman in. Some ushers was half packing her. They set her back about five or six rows. This was Houston, Texas. The night before, a few nights before this picture was taken there in the big Sam Houston Coliseum. And the ushers had got her up and some young man had given her a seat and they set her down and the poor old thing is so crippled. And the blessing that should have went to this woman, there stood that light over the woman circling around, the old woman. I looked at her. I said, Sister, you are a believer. Yes. I said, they just brought you here by plane. You come from Ohio. She said, that's right. She said, that's right. And I said, because you've been following several meetings, trying to get in and never have been able to arrive at the time. She said, that's right. I said, Jesus has healed you. Stand up. Throw away your crutches. And that woman who could hardly move through her crutches and run around the building as hard as she could run, screaming and shouting. See? It was her faith. See? No matter what, See, this woman didn't have faith. That woman had faith. Visions are coming by your faith and God's will. Now, if I got time, I'd just like to tell you a little story that happened recently. How many times could I have thousands of cases of, of visions. And l let me quote this to you as quickly as, as, as I can. I was on my road to, down to meet Brother Bosworth down in Florida. And I saw a vision of a little boy being killed. He had little short pants on like uh, Brother and we wore when we were little boys. Long ribbed stockings. Had a little, what we call a crock haircut. Little brown eyes. He'd been killed in an automobile accident. His tongue was out, his eyes was licked back, and he was, was laying out on the side of a road. And this great evergreen tree standing, 
and rocks was all wrapped around. And I went down there and stood on the platform and predicted. And I said, Mr. Lindsay, the voice of healing will pack this article. I've seen this child being killed. And I'll find him somewhere. It's thus saith the Lord. I said, write it on the fly leaf of your Bible. And if you just notice in my Bible, the fly leaves are rolled up of visions and things that will come to pass. There's never been one fail, but this last one here that's just now happening, it can't fail. God has no failure. See? If it was me, it would fail every time. If it's him, it can't fail. Now, notice, two nights after that, a frantic father standing out there where they know they brought me in. The ushers are standing there to help me get to this tent. And the ushers come to me and said, we're just having to hold a father off over there. And I said, why? He said, his little boy got drowned this morning in the irrigation ditch, and he won't even let the undertakers take that baby. And so he's laying out there on a the bank. And, of course, no one knows just where I stay because I'm not an isolationist. I love people. I love to meet people. I like to go home with every one of you and see how good you could cook corn pone and black-eyed peas. I love them. But I, I can't be the servant of God and the servant of man. I, I, I got to keep myself away on account of these things. And be alert. And when you come to the service, be ready. Whatever the Father wants you to do, go do it. I've stopped meetings where thousands were sitting, walk right out to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Never one time has it failed. So this father, I said, well, I'll go take a look at the child. They take me back. No, it wasn't a child. The boy was black-headed, well-dressed, little bitty fellow about five years old. This boy's about eight or ten. I said, no, it isn't, a, it isn't a child, sir. I'm sorry, but it isn't. I offered prayer for the father when he was weeping so hard over his little boy. Went on. Now, across America and through Canada, there's probably people right here who had that wrote on their book. Uh, hey, how many ever heard of it? Let's see your hands. All right, anybody had it on their book? Uh, wrote in the flyleaf of their Bible. Thousands times thousands. Up in Copio, Finland, I've been down in England, been around in France and different places, and up, and I was at Copio, Finland, and we'd been up on the hill I hadn't eaten for several days, and was praying. Mr. Lindsay and them was with me, I said, something's fixing to happen. So what is it, Brother Bram? I said, I don't know. I've done forgot that vision. I said, I don't know, but something's fixing to happen. So what do you think it is? I said, I don't know. We started down the hill. And look way down about a mile ahead of us, coming down off the mountain, <clears throat> up there watching how the Russians come over and swarmed on the city and, and machine gunned it and so forth during the time of the war. And I thought those poor little Finns, how lovely they were and how deserving they are. And they, now I looked, and there was a car, an uh, automobile, American made Ford, and oh, they had, haven't got. 200 of them in the whole nation, I guess. And it had struck two little children, and one of them had rolled over it, mashed him under, and kicked him out from behind the, the car. And the driver, the fender hit the other end of the side of the chin and hit him against the tree and broke his, crushed his brain in back here at his back. Well, about 20 minutes later, we come to the scene. Mr. Moore, which will be in the meeting probably tomorrow or either meet me at the other meeting. Mr. Lindsay, Mr. Baxter, many witnesses was along, and as we got out of the car, they did to look. The little boy was laying with a coat over him, and another car had picked the other little boy. He wasn't dead, so they took him on to the hospital. This little boy was laying there, and of course, they can't move him because it's against the law to move him until the parents has looked at him, and they're gone for their mother and father. Well, I thought, oh, my, that poor little mother and father. What will they think when they find their boy laying there dead? Although, what if I get a telegram from America and little Billy Paul had been killed and mashed on the road like that? How would I feel? Way across the seas here with these meetings, what would I do? I thought, what's that little daddy going to do out there with a hole out there in the field? That little mother with the axe chopping poles or something, what's she going to think? A poor little thing. I just started kind of crying out. I prayed. Brother Moore and I'm standing around. I thought, I believe I'll take a look at the child. So they raised up the coat, and that poor little thing laying there, bloody and out of his ears and everything. I said, oh, my. Now watch how stupid a person can get. And I said, oh, my. Covering him. I, I, I started to move away like this. 
and I felt somebody put their hand on my shoulder. I thought it was Brother Moore or Brother Lindsay once. How many of you ever heard of Brother Moore or Brother Lindsay? The editor of the voice singing, he's right there singing on. And so put his hand, I said, Brother, and Brother Moore was standing, well, nobody was in 10 feet of me. And a hand was laying on my shoulder. See, when God speaks, God's going to confront, burn that thing. And I thought, whose hand is this? And when I turned back, the hand left me. Well, I thought, I, did I imagine that? I turned and started away again, and that hand come back again. And I looked around again, and they were showing the little boy to someone else. Many of the people were standing around. And I looked down, I looked up, and there was them evergreen trees, them rocks slapped together. I looked again, I said, Uncle, oh, you'll never know what it means, friend. All devil out of hell, can't stop it now. God said so. I said, Brother Moore. He said, yes, Brother Brandon. Brother Lindsay. Brother Baxter. Yes. Get your Bible right quick. What's the matter? I said, turn to the fly leaf. They said, well, what? I said, look. We'll be in a country where there's evergreen trees, lap rocks together, a little boy around nine years old, hair cut like crock, brown hair, brown eyes, tongue out, feet run through his stockings, ribs, stockings. He said, that's him. I said, certainly that's him. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. There's no one, there's no way to explain what that feeling is. It's not faith. It's done beyond faith. It's a spoken word of God then. I said, if that child, to, through the interpreter, I said, if that child isn't on his feet alive in the next five minutes, I'm a false prophet. I stand still now and see the glory of God. I fix myself in position the way it was in the vision. I said, Heavenly Father, you who has now promised this over in a homeland two years before and has brought this to pass, now, being that all the communists are around and they're denying your only son, and if thou hast foreordained this to be and has shown me this vision in the homeland, therefore I ask for his spirit to return again in the name of Jesus Christ. The little boy leaped to his feet and screamed again and run all around. This is perfectly normal and well as he could be. Now, that boy's name is in the book if you want to write to him today and ask him. That night when I went into the meeting, they had to take me for all the way down the road. That's one of the thousands. All the way down the road when they're taking me down with a group of little soldiers, poor little fellows hadn't even shaved, little 16-year-old boys in a Finnish army, big boots on, great big long coats on, with six bayonets on their guns. And they're taking me down. As I walk down the road, brethren, a man of honor will be truthful. And as I walk down the road, there stood Russians, soldiers, with the Russian salute, the tears running down their cheeks. They said, we will receive a God like this. Sure. What's the matter? What makes communists is because the church let down the bars. That's why you've put it to a social gospel. You've limited it to creeds. The gospel still has the same power. And I see those rough soldiers put their arms around the Finnish soldiers and hug each other. And anything that will make a Russian and a Finn hug one another will settle wars forever. Amen. That's right. Christ is the answer. Right. We don't need round tables and big four meetings and so forth. What we need today is the gospel of Jesus Christ preached though in simplicity, yet in its power and demonstration of the resurrection. That's what the world needs. That's what it's hungry for. Well, all, everybody's hungry for that. Yes. All is ordained. All the Father has given me will come to me. My sheep know my voice. 
You can't feed them on corn cobs. They've got to have the corn. Not where the corn was, but the corn itself. Not just a dry... Well, a gospel, as we would call it, as a gospel of history, but a gospel of the living Christ. What good would it do to show a man that's freezing to death a big bonfire painted? That's what history does. It paints a fire. A freezing man can't get warmed by a painted picture. He's got to have the reality. What the world needs today is the, not a picture of Holy Ghost and fire, but the real resurrected Christ by the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire again. That's what the world needs today. A reality. Something that they can rely upon, not a declaration of words, but a realization of a risen Christ. Amen. Now, I'll never forget going in that night, these little soldiers taking me in, their fixed bayonets and the people standing on the street crying, they let twenty-something thousand come in, then let them go out and twenty more thousand come in. So as I went in, I was going through the woman's, or well, the ladies' dormitory in this big building, and there was the door slammed and a little girl stepped out. And I love little kitties. Oh, I can just imagine when I get home the day after tomorrow, get little Joseph on my back and Rebecca under one arm, Sarah on the other. What a time we have. I just love them, little innocent fellows. Oh, over there when they, they had the afternoon meeting, Mr. Baxter and them would, for the afternoon meeting, all the people would be down there and the little kids would be on the street. I'd get some of that old money and go down there and buy some of this candy. And I had a string of kids all the way down the city block following me, buying candy, you know, and handing it to the little fellas and cuffing their little ears, you know, and, and pulling their little nose and just having a good time, you know, like that. They couldn't talk. So I mean, they could talk their language, but I couldn't understand them. So then I'd see the adults coming. I'd slip around the corner and get back in the hotel, you know. So then a great time of that night going in, I heard the door slam. And a little Finnish girl stepped out of the dormitory, and she had crutches. And I looked at her, and she just very bashful, and I looked at the little thing. And they had been forbidden and said, if I seen on the street not to go near or something, there, oh, I, that makes me feel bad, but you know how it is. It's a stampede, so they had to say that. So I looked, and she was standing there, and she, I seen the way she was. One leg was a little shorter than the other. And this lady here had no use. And she had a, a, a brace that went up over her shoe, come up and around her hip, and a brace around this way, and in the toe of her shoe she had a snap. A piece of leather run over and caught the back of the brace here. And when she went to walk, she'd set her little crutches out, take this leather that would raise that foot, and set it out, this brace would hold it so it wouldn't give down, and that's how she walked. She'd raise her little foot, set it out, and walk. Now, listen just a moment. Every dad and mother here knows what a little child means to you. And seeing that little thing, just about the age of my little Rebecca now, I looked at her. I knew that child wanted to come to me. I'm just letting down my collar now to talk to you as a dad or a mother. I knew that child wanted to come to me. And I said, you want to see me, sweetheart? Of course, she couldn't understand what I said. The Finnish soldier said, mm, mm, mm. I said, wait a minute. And I looked at her again. She raised up her little head and her little ragged haircut and her little skirts hanging real low and ragged. I found out she was a little Finnish war orphan. She didn't have any father and mother, and she was living in a tent. The Russians had killed her father and mother in the war when they come over the line. I didn't know it at that time. But I seen her little ragged clothes, and she raised her little head, and tears running down her little cheeks, her little baby blue eyes. I said, you want to see me, sweetheart? And it happened to be I had on this same suit. This suit was given to me. And she said, looked over at me like that, she couldn't make out what I was saying. I motioned to her like that. Well, she acted like she was scared first, and she set her little crutch out, raised her little shoulder up. I just stood still like this and watched that child. 
I might act hard hearted, but I I got a heart. And as that little thing come up close to me, she set her little crutch down. I thought, what's she gonna do? I'm just gonna see what she's gonna do. She put her little crutch down like that to the side of me, and she caught this pocket right here. And she raised up my coat and kissed my coat and dropped it down. I honestly you know how you'd feel. And she put her little crutches out, tucked her little skirts and pulled them out like that, very typical of the little finish. And she said, keep us, keep us means thank you. I tell you, I, I just felt like it. I could just break right out to screaming. And they were singing, only believe in there for me to come in. And I thought, bless her little heart. And as I looked, I saw a vision. Sure, if I'd been the biggest hypocrite in the world, God would have honored her faith. That's right. I saw a vision, and there she went without her braces, walking. I said, sweetheart, listen, uh, oh my, I said, how can I make her know it? I said, honey, uh, Jesus makes you well. You, you understand, sweetheart? You, you. And the little soldiers then, somebody come out there, a bunch of them, blah, 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 and grabbed me by the arm, and away I went. And I thought, well, God will let her know somehow. I went on in, and there the, after the Lord began to move out to the audience and tell them people all their things out in there. And they just begin to raise up in God healing. Then when all the sins give out the prayer cards, they called up a few of them. And then I said, well, my brother come to me, kind of pat me on the sides. So that's enough, Billy. That's enough. You got to go. Mr. Baxter got me on. I said, I just feel led. Let's call just a few more. I said, don't call, but just about five or six more. Yes, I just feel led to do it, Brother Baxter. I said, all right, call him. I said, let uh, some more of the next five come up like that, and they interpret it there. And by God, sovereign grace, she was the next one. And here she comes. They brought her out from a little place there out of the room where she's at, brought her up to the platform before thousands of people. I said, Miss Isaacson, just say what I say. Yes, Brother Branham, she said. I said, Sweetheart, you're the little girl that was out in the room. Yes, you are. I said, Jesus healed you, honey. I've already saw the vision, you're healed. Now you go over and let some of the men take the braces off, and when you do, you put your little hand on your hip, just let your little hip, hand slip just about as far as your leg is sharp. Then come show, Brother Van. Oh, well, away she went over there, and when the interpreter had interpreted, take her over there, I called the next person, just the time the vision had left, here she come across the platform, crutch over her head, braces over her head, running and jumping and leaping and appraising God. God! Could you give us five minutes more? I want to tell you something. Yeah. Will you do it? Supper? I know it's hard. I want to tell you about the other little kitty, if, if you'll pardon me. This is long, but just a minute. The other little boy was laying down. The second night of the service, which this was, oh, that little mother, that other boy was frantic. And when they'd take me into the hotel at night, they just had to drag me over the top of her. And so she was screaming out her Finnish language at, young mother in her 20s, so I'd go on to the room because it was against the rules for me to stop for her. I went on up. That night when I got into that little mother, we drug over her like that. And that day, the day, day before that, Miss Isaac said, Brother Bram, can you just give her a minute out here in the hall? I said, all right, bring her up. Her and her husband come up. And uh, I said, now you interpret for me. And she, little mother, frantically, you know, rubbed her little hands and you women, what if you had to dress like they dress? In the summertime, great big thick dresses like that and big boots and pitch hay. <laughs> you think about wearing these little ungodly clothes out in your front yard then. You see? See how they were? But really honest, lovely people. And there she was standing there, a little face, her little white hair pulled back like that. And she was blabbering off something as hard as she could. I said, Miss I said, she wants you to go raise her little boy. And I said, Sister, I, I have no way of doing that. I said that. She said, well, but my little boy's not dead, and the other little boy is dead, and you raised him up. I said, no, sister dear, I had nothing to do with that. I said, over in the homelands two years ago, God showed that vision. It's been wrote in books and everything. Well, she says, go see a vision for my little boy. <laughs> well, that's a mother alive. And I said, sister, that's very lovely of you, but I can't see visions. God has to show them. It's not what I want. It's what he wants. And she said... Well, I said, by the way, are you all Christians? No. Well, I said, look, if you're not Christians, if your little boy dies, 
then he'll go to heaven. He's just a little bitty boy, just six years old, or five years old, I believe it was. I said, he'll go to heaven. And if you die in your sins, you can't go where he's at. But if God takes him and you become a Christian, then you can go and live with him. There'll never be an accident there. And I said, then look, if you wanted a favor out of me, you'd do me a favor. Yes. I said, well, now look, why don't you surrender your lives and say you're going to live a Christian life, and perhaps you might find grace in the sight of God. Well, they couldn't lose, so they thought that's the thing to do. So they got out on the floor, and I told them what to do, and they got out, not just to make up now. They really prayed and cried, little mother holding dad around the neck and this, crying with one another. They got back up. I said, now you go, and God will probably uh, do something for your child. She said, come go to the hospital. I said, no, that's against the rules. See, if I went to see your baby, and then I had some other baby, then if I didn't go there, then that make that mother feel bad. See, I said, I'll just pray for the baby. Well, I said, you wouldn't want me to violate rules. I'm not supposed to do that. And she said, well, uh, I said, if God shows me a vision, I'll tell you. She said, now go see vision. I said, well, I can't do that, sister. She said, I'll just wait then. You, you go see vision, I'll wait. And I said, I said, no, sister, I, that's not the way it is. He may never show me nothing about it. You just go home and believe. Well, finally, Miss Isaacson got her away and tell her that if God give a vision, she'd, she'd call back. She hadn't been gone 10 minutes. Until the first thing you know, the phone ring. Was anybody here ever in Finland? Or any Finns, I hope this don't offend you because I think you're the, one of the nicest people in the world. It's got a little stick like you put in here and pull a crank. And so the lady called up and said, Brother Bram, seen vision yet? No. About 10 minutes again, cranked again. Brother Bram, seen vision yet? No. And just on until we went to service and the little girl healed that night. I come in, I, not this Bible, but another Bible. I walked up and my brother, now, Canadian friends, don't, don't feel hurt. But one time in Canada, we got some bad candy. They didn't have the ingredients to put in it right after the war. And Howard said to me, he said, Billy, you talk about candy flat in Canada. Taste this. He gave me two little blocks of candy. Well, all of them went to the rooms, and I went to my room. I was standing in my room, this great big old marble table, and I had the Bible over my heart. And at that time, along in May, the sun hardly goes down. That's the land of the midnight sun. He's just a year, a whole year just makes one day and night. So you could read the newspaper nearly in a street. So I was looking out towards the east and I had my hand up in the window like this. I said, oh, great Jehovah, someday you'll send Jesus. He shall come from the eastern sky. What a wonderful time. And the soldiers and all going through the park just talking about what had happened that night. I thought, isn't that lovely? Look at them. Such humble Christian people. How they were going along talking. I said, oh, Jesus, you're wonderful. And I heard something go. And I looked down in front of me, and there sat a big tall vase about that big, sat down there, and it had two, uh, we call them Easter flowers, I believe you call them daffodil or what, that looked like that little old-fashioned radio or phonograph horns, like, you know, and some of them are yellow and some white. Is that daffodils, lady? Is that jonquils or daffodils? Jonquils. I don't know much about them. Anyhow, they're little, we call them Easter flowers in our country. And they were sitting there, and one of them was laying towards the south, and one was laying towards the north. And the one laying towards the south was laying all the way down. Uh, one towards the north is laying all the way down. The one towards the south is about halfway down. And I thought, well, now, them wasn't there a minute ago. Where did they come from? Now, I'm standing right like this. I remember I've got to meet you all in glory someday. And as I turned my head, there he stood standing there, that angel. Big man, not like the Christ. He's a great big fellow. Dark skin, brown, dark hair to his shoulder, white robe on, arms folded like this. And he always, that's the reason I bring the people to my right, bring them to the platform. It passes him first. So I uh, looked down there, and there he stood. Now you can imagine how you felt. I couldn't hardly breathe. And I looked over again. I looked back. I started biting on the finger. I looked again. He looked at me and said, what did your brother give you? And I said, these two pieces of candy, sir. He said, why don't you eat them? Well, I broke one of them off and put it in my mouth. I started chewing. Tastes pretty good. I swallowed it. When I swallowed it, the one that was laying down the Easter flower towards the north, now that was geographically just the way those children fell. And the one towards the north went, stood up. And I thought, well, now that's, 
I said, what does that mean? He never said a word. I watched those flyers again. I looked around him. He said, eat the other one. Well, I put it in my mouth, and the bitterest thing I ever put in my mouth. Oh, my, such a taste. I tug it out like that, and, and I watched this flower now was leaning towards the south, and it was going, going lower and lower like a heartbeat, going, He said, fail to eat it, and the other child will die. Now, what that meant, clergyman, don't ask me. I don't know. I put it right in my mouth, and I held my breath, and it shoot real quick, and I swallowed it. And when I swallowed it that time, the one that was leaning towards the south went, <laughs> stood upside the other. He said, go tell the mother, thus saith the Lord, her child will live. I run out into the hall real quick and get a scream and talk my voice. Here come Brother Baxter with his pajamas on. Brother Moore running down the hall. I said, get Mrs. Isaacson right away. Right quick. So they went and got her. I said, call the mother and tell her, thus saith the Lord. Her prayers are heard. Oh, what a feeling. She called the house. The babysitter said, the mother and father has been called to the hospital. They have never, well, it's just a little house there like for a hospital. Said, they've been called there, the baby's dying. Said, they've never even washed the baby yet because it's so crushed in the back. Said, the baby's dying and they've been called and she was just there as a babysitter. Miss Ice can turn around. I said, just hang it up and call the hospital. So she hung up and called the hospital and she got there and she got the mother on the phone. And she said, uh, the woman was screaming at the top of her voice. Miss Ice said, now look, dear, quieten down just a minute. Quieten down till I can tell you. And I, uh, Ms. Isis and I could see her, you know, going through the motions. And she said, I'm trying to quieten her. She's screaming and said, maybe the baby's dead. I said, tell her not to worry. No matter if he's dead or what, he's going to live. And uh, so she kept trying to quieten her. And she said, now look, listen to me. See, she said, Brother Branham had just saw a vision about a flower raising up. And said, he said, tell you, thus saith the Lord, your baby is going to live. And when she got to herself, around which she said, how well I know it, said he's just come to himself and we're washing him and fixing to take him home now. God had answered prayer. Now look, I never had one thing to do with that. I never had nothing to do with the healing of that baby. That mother's faithful prayer found grace in the sight of God. God just spoke to me and said, go tell her. You see what I mean? That doesn't make you weak. That makes you shout. Those things are true. God in heaven knows it. There's your names and addresses if you wish to write to them. He's the same great Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. 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 Heavens and earth will pass away, but his word will never fail. When he made a promise, he made it sovereignly. It's to whosoever will that can receive it, can believe it, can act upon the same. The same results will come every time. Amen. Oh, I get emotional. It's enough to make you emotional. To know how a poor, low sinner hell bound. Speaking to my wife the other day. Sitting out there, a lady come brought me a little plaque. Said, sunset and evening star and one curl, curl call for me. And I was hiding in the house. There's so many people around. And I said, sweetheart, think of it. Twenty-five years ago, my father drank so. I said, just think of it. I go downtown to talk to somebody. Just because I was a brand and they turned their head and walked away. I couldn't help it. And I said, now think of it. I have to hide somewhere in the wilderness to get this a little time of peace. What did it? My education, I had none. What did it? Personality, I had none. What did it? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speak down by amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Oh, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. The eternal ages as he rolled out, 
the redeeming love of Christ will still be known amongst his people while the, the oceans has wept theirself into deserts and when sin has heaped so high until it shut the moon out of its socket, the love of God will still endure. And the Christ that lives tonight will be the same Jesus and as he sits on his soul in his high pinnacle of glory. Oh, in eternity he'll still be the same. Oh, I want to see him. I love him. Not long ago down in the Southland, an old colored man got saved one night in an old hymn singing. He went telling his slaves the next day, he said, Brethren, Christ has made me free. So the owner come by and he said, Mose, what's this you're saying? He said, Boss. He said, That's true, I'm free. He said, Who told you you was free? He said, Christ made me free, boss. He said, Moses, you come on up to my office. I want to see you a little bit. Walked up there and sat down. The nice quote that again, Moses. He said, I was out uh, last night to a prayer meeting. He said, it was saying him. I was a sinner, boss. He said, Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. He said, do you mean it, Moses? He said, yes, boss. He said, I'll go down and sign the proclamation this morning, and I'll set you free from slavery that you can preach to your brother, man. I said, thank you, boss. Years passed. He preached. When he come to die, many of his white brethren had gathered in, watched him, he went in a coma. At the end of the, after a while, he woke up, looked around. He said, ain't I gone yet? They said, Mose, what did you see? He said, well, brethren, he said, I just entered in the gate. And said, I stood and I see. He said, I looked at him. He said, an angel come up and said, Mose, come over and get your robe and crown. He said, don't talk to me about a robe and crown. All I want to do is stand and look at him. I think that's the feeling of us all. I don't want a robe and crown. I want to see him. He was pierced for my salvation by his stripes I was healed, who has redeemed me from a life of sin and death. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the hours wear on. Christ still lives. Oh, how could we ever express Jesus Christ to a people? It's beyond any expression. Have mercy tonight, Father. Save the lost tonight. Heal the sick tonight. And manifest thyself. And, oh, God, we're over in Finland. Those two little boys are living tonight because of your grace. How many more around over the country, around over the world, from all parts of the world, everywhere, how your spirit has moved and how it has healed the sick, raised the dead, Africa, India, all through Egypt, all, all, all over the world, Thou hast done these great things, and we thank Thee for all things. And now here You are with us tonight, Your armor present, and we're up here in Spindale, North Carolina. You're here tonight, the same lovely Lord Jesus. May the people thoroughly understand, Lord, that healing doesn't lay in a man. It doesn't lay within a group of man. It doesn't lay in a church. It lays in the finished work that you did for us, yonder at Calvary, in our faith to believe upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was given to us at Calvary. And Father dear, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come lovely, sweetly, and to every heart and speak to the unsaved tonight, Father. Just now, give us a great altar call, Father. May men and women who doesn't know you has never seen in the power of your resurrection. May their faith be greater than those who have seen you. May they believe even before they see you. And may it come to pass that they will believe with all their hearts, every one of them, and be made completely whole and forgiven of every sin and every trespass. Grant it, Lord, while we have our heads bowed and the organs are playing, I wonder just if there would be someone here would raise your hand and say, Lord, I'm not raising my hand to that minister. I'm raising my hand to you. 
I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who raised from the dead, and I now want to accept him as my personal Savior. I ask you to have mercy on me that when I have to stand in the presence of this company and with this preacher and with your spirit that's here tonight, I want to be free from sin, the law of sin. I want to love you so that I want to look on your face and peace. Here you say, it's well done, my good and faithful servant. Knowing that the days are dark that we're living in, would you raise your hand? Someone anywhere? God bless you, lady. God bless you, Sonny. God bless you, lady. God bless you, lady. God bless you. That's right. Over to my right. Anyone in this section? God bless you. God bless you. Someone else? Back down towards the end. Someone down in there. Raise your hand. Remember me, God. Now, as I offer my hand, how did you raise your hand? Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draws him. God bless you, sister. See you right down here in the front row. Yes, and God bless you. Someone, uh, God bless you, little lady. Someone else raise your hand. I see a little bitty girl, just a little bitty thing raising her hand. Now, you say, does that do any good, Brother Ben? God bless you, sonny boy. God bless you, sir. Does it do any good? Listen what Jesus said. No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that comes to me, I will give eternal life. He that heareth my words, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting eternal life, shall not perish, but pass from death unto life. Will you raise your hand now just to say, I now accept Jesus as my personal Savior? Would you keep your heads bowed? Keep praying. Will you raise your hand? Some eight or ten or more. God bless you. Someone else? Raise your hand. Say, Say, if you'll just, God bless you back there, sir, that's mighty fine. God bless you. Someone else, raise your hand. Say, God, I want to be remembered right now in prayer. Brother Preacher, I want you to pray for me that my soul will be saved at that day. Will you raise your hand? Say, remember, God bless you, lady. I see you way up in the balcony. Someone else? Uh, God bless you, sir. I see you, young man. A very gallant thing to do. You might have done a mighty great things in your life. But you've never done as great a thing as when you raise your hand to Christ Jesus. He that will come to me, God bless you, young man sitting there. He that will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Will you raise your hand? Christ, I now believe you. I now believe I want to accept you as my personal Savior. Will you raise your hands in the altar call? Any backsliders? that wants to come back to the Lord Jesus, wants to be remembered tonight in prayer, would you raise your hands, backsliders? Surely if he'll open the eyes of the blind, unstop the ears of the deaf, surely he'll hear for your sinful soul. Will you raise your hand, backslider? Will you who are, are now seeking the Holy Spirit, will you raise your hand and say, remember me? Oh my, the hands are going up everywhere. Why, he's just as willing to pour out the Holy Ghost upon you right now as he ever would be. Sure. Now, we're going to pray for you, as we promised. And immediately at the healing service, I want you to come to this altar when the minister makes the altar call. And I want you to pray right here at the altar and just surrender your life to him, that he'll give you the desire of your heart. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the slumming of uh, this hour, the sacredness of knowing that Jesus, God's Son, stands present, the one that we're to give an account to at the end of the age. We must bow our knees sometime, either here or like the rich man did when he was in hell, it lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And we pray, Father, that you'll save everyone that lifted their hand and fill them this night with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, giving them the blessed seal of the promise of God that they shall never perish, but will always be in thy memory and on the written in the palms of your hands and in the Lamb's book of life. These blessings, Father, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Don't you feel just like you're just kind of scoured out? God's presence so near with us. What card you give out? Huh? 
I never did buy any cars. Well, all right. Christ is sure anyhow. We don't need any cars. How many believes? I want to ask you something then. I don't do this. I usually try to have the people here at the platform so I can sovereignly do it. Probably got busy in the books or something. Never got it till this meeting started. They know better to do it after meetings in progress. I want to ask you something. What I told you about vision, do you believe that's the truth? Then if you'll look this way and me knowing none of you, and Jesus Christ by his grace and power will do the same thing here tonight that he did to the woman that touched his garment. Will you believe with all your heart? Will you accept it with all your heart? Grant it, God, is my prayer. Give us just a little card. You know, abide with me. Can you play it right off the back of the book? Give us a card. Is that what you want him to do? You believe God comes by song? Is it power in song? You remember the prophet got his righteous indignation all stirred one time? Oh, he was all tore up about something. And Jezebel's boy and Ahab come down and want to know a vision from him. He said, why don't you go to your own prophets? Why you come to me for? Oh, he was all stirred up. He said, nevertheless, bring me a minstrel. And when the minstrel began to play, the Spirit come up on the prophet, and he saw visions. Is that right? Now you have faith and believe. Just believe. This is hard. See, something I don't know, none of you. You know that. But God knows you all. Now, back in the audience is a little hard, because when I call you, you wouldn't catch it. But many times he stands over the people back there. But you can sit, and if the people don't respond quickly, the vision leaves, and I don't know what I said. See? But it ought to settle it. If Christ is raised from the dead, I was going to have a different prior type of prayer line, but how many here is sick and needy? Let's see your hands again. Everywhere, the people that wants to be prayed for, raise up your hand everywhere. There's just too many. There's a thousand more here. I couldn't say who would be first on that. We'll just do it this way. Let the Lord bless us if he will. Now, if he will, I don't know. That's up to him. But look this away and believe that I've told you the truth. And God will hold me judgment, the judgment whether I've told it from the Bible or not. Now, you just look this way and believe. Now, as we think, abide with me. Abide with me. He that, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it will be given unto you. Now, I ask God upon the solemn promise of this to send his son Christ Jesus and anoint his servant, unworthy, but that the people might be without an excuse at the day of judgment that Christ is living tonight, and may God send his Holy Spirit upon you to give you faith to contact the Holy Ghost that he might speak through me while we abide in his divine promise. Will you grant it? Now from this side somewhere as I consecrate concentrate on this side to watch you just to see where God would move. Would you look this way and pray? May he grant it. If he will, will every person in here solemnly say, I'll believe God that he's here and believe that if I can contact him in my faith through that way, I know he's sure to be contacted for my healing. Will you believe it? With all your heart, raise your hand to him now where he can see it, you see. See your hand. God bless you. So, yeah, I preached. I didn't mean to just talk a few minutes and I kind of a little bit disturbed. That's right. But I'll just be reverent, just a few minutes. 
I can't make God do anything. I have to ask Him. Then I asked Him, I've got to believe that He is and a rewarder. Look, there's probably 2,000 people or maybe more in here tonight. Every one of them is a spirit. And it's just a beating now, like this. Where is it at? I don't know. It's from every side. But if you'll just be quiet just a minute, sit still, don't move around. Just be quiet just a minute and pray. May He grant it. That'll be a sign that He's raised from the dead. That'll be a miracle. Would that be a miracle? Well, I should say a miracle. One of the greatest. I'll just have to wait till you quiet, that everybody puts moving and quiet down. Just, just be reverent. See, Christ is not, he, he's God. And the Bible said, let the world keeps silent. God is in his holy place. It's not a commotion. It's not a confusion. God's not an author of confusion. I see standing before me a man. Thanks be to God. Move a thin like fellow. Someone touched him just like the woman touched our Lord. Somebody touched the... There he is. You got heart trouble and kidney trouble, had not you, sir? Sitting right down there, looking this way to me. Yeah, look back sideways there. Yes, sir. You believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? All right, stand up on your feet. That's right. Raise up. Feel a little beside yourself. But you're healed now. God bless you. A heart won't bother you more. The kidney trouble's all right, so you can go home now and be well. Say praise the Lord to him. Amen. God bless you. Now somebody over in this section, look and believe. If thou canst believe, he said, all things are possible to them that believe. Got heart trouble, haven't you? Sitting here in lady. You believe that Jesus make you well? Yes. Yeah. Just praying about your heart. You believe Jesus Christ make you well? Raise up your hand. You have a prayer you, know, you don't of course you don't have a prayer card. Now, you believe that he taught you touched him then? Maybe you can't hear my voice. This is a rebound. You believe that Christ healed you then? You accept your healing from Christ? God bless you. Amen. Praying for that little boy, aren't you? You believe? Sir? You have faith in God? Yes. You're praying for him, aren't you? The child. You believe God will heal him? Operations might fail, but Christ never fails, does he? You believe his breathing will be all right now and he'll get all right and be well? You accept it? Raise up your hand if you will. <laughs> See? Isn't that wonderful? You can have what you ask for now. Jesus Christ makes it well. Isn't he wonderful? Amen. Grandmother, you want to pray for your grandson there, don't you? <laughs> yes, ma'am. You. If God will reveal to me what's your trouble, will you accept me as God's prophet, his servant? you got a heart trouble yourself. The little boy there has got a... Uh, kind of a sinus, asthmatic condition, and God can make him well. Isn't that right? If you raise up your hand, that's right. Put your hand over on the child. 
In Jesus Christ's name, may it be healed. Amen. Let's say praise the Lord. That little woman sitting back there with a little scarf around her neck's got bronchial trouble. You believe, Mother, that Jesus Christ make you well? You believe, Brother, with the diabetes sitting there, Jesus Christ will make you well? Then stand on your feet and accept it. Turn around and lay your hands on that little woman back there. She's stuck with a bronchial back there. Yes. God, be merciful and heal them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. It's over. Go home rejoicing. Your face made you whole. What do you think over here in these stretchers? Look this way and believe. Sir, lady, you're sitting there by the side of me. You believe? You do? I can heal you. You know I can. But you couldn't hide your life. You're dying. Cancer's got you. That's true. But Jesus Christ can heal you. Do you believe it? That's your trouble, isn't it? Cancer in a worse stage. There's a dark shadow around you. Only God can make you well. Will you believe it? You accept it, you're going to die there. There were some lepers laid at the gate one time. They were lepers. They said, if we go in the city, they're eating one another's children. We can't go in there. We sit here, we're sure to die. You only had one chance. Let's go down to the colony of the Syrians, the enemy. And God rewarded them for taking that only chance they had. And God spared their life and all of them in, the, in captivity. Now, you're not asked to the camp of the enemy. You're invited to the house of God, where you're expected tonight. Now, it's your faith, sir. I can't heal you. It's your faith. If you believe it, then get up and go on home. Forget about it. If you can't, then you're, you can't live but a little while. I challenge anybody to believe. Hallelujah! Do you believe? With all your heart. Then what are you waiting on? Let's get it. Let's all of you be healed. All of you is already healed. Jesus healed you. Can you accept it? Let's lay our, raise our hands to him then like this. Repeat this prayer after me. I'll say the prayer. You repeat it. You mean it. Heavenly Father, I now believe in Jesus Christ, thy Son. I now accept him as my healer. By his stripes I am healed. I believe with all my heart that he healed me in his vicarious suffering at Calvary. And I now claim it my possession. And from this night, I'll claim my healing. In Jesus' name. Now, just close your eyes. That's your prayer. Now, this is mine. Oh, God. Here's the one thing to keep a miracle from breaking this place to pieces. That's that little dark shadow that's hanging over you right now. That's your unbelief. If I could only get that to move away. If something that would move, every person in here would be healed. Every one of you. That's the only thing that's keeping it. Jesus has already done it. And it just looked like now, in this dimension where I am now, you couldn't hide your life if you had to. Christ is here. The same one that raised a little boy from the dead in Finland. He's here tonight. Visions are breaking. I see people being healed all out across the building. You ministers watch and see months after I'm gone, your people be coming. Women being healed with ladies' trouble, stomach troubles, everything's being healed right now. If you believe me, I'm telling you the truth. Christ is here. The Holy Ghost is in the building. 